Welcome to the Australian Hiker Podcast, Australia's longest running hiking podcast, downloaded over three quarters of a million times in 150 countries and providing you with an Australian perspective on all things hiking. We're your hosts, Tim and Jill Savage, coming to you from Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. In today's episode, episode 239, we introduce my upcoming Tasmanian South Coast track trip. We hope you enjoy. Before we get into today's episode, if you'd like to help support Australian Hiker and this podcast, there are a couple of ways that you can help us out. Firstly, by subscribing on your podcast host of choice so that each episode is available as soon as it's published. And if you have the opportunity, leave us a five-star review. Another way to support us is go to the Australian Hiker website at www.australianhiker.com.au and click on the supporters page and buy us a coffee. You can do a one-off donation or become a monthly supporter. All donations are greatly appreciated and help us to continue producing this podcast and blog. Now let's get on to today's episode. This is the first in a planned series of four podcast episodes, including a full trip review to be released over the coming weeks on my upcoming trip on the Tasmanian South Coast track. In this episode, we set the scene and provide some background on what I expect from this trip. As we record this podcast, in five days' time, I'm actually going to be starting my walk on the South Coast track. This is a track that for many years has been considered one for experienced hikers only, but over the past few years has become more accessible and more available to hikers with less experience. This is very much a true wilderness track, and it's one that requires a fair amount of logistics to organise to get to and from the trailheads. Now, in relation to the track itself, the track is an 85 kilometre distance, and it's designed to be walked over a six to eight day period, uh, with my plan on doing it in five days. Because you've got to do it faster than everybody else. (laughs) Well, I must admit, I've talked to a, a, a number of people who have done it in different uh, uh, different durations. In fact, I talked to someone at work today who's done the track, who lives in Tasmania, and they've done it in four days. And I know a number of people who have done it. Mind you, his comment was that he didn't spend as much time taking in the scenery uh, and, and, and seeing what was there. So, yeah, I, well, potentially I could do this in four days. But, yeah, that, that I think would really be pushing it. And doing it in five is going to give me a bit more leeway. In addition, I do have a couple of days up my sleeve, so if the weather conditions don't work or some of the creek or river crossings don't work, I do have a bit of time up my sleeve to be able to spend a bit more time if need be. Distance-wise, my plans are 23.9 kilometres on the first day, 18.6 kilometres on my second day, 18.4 kilometres on my third day, 12.2 kilometres on the fourth day, and 11.4 kilometres on the fifth day. So when you just look at the distances themselves, it doesn't really seem to be a lot. Having said that, though, there is some difficult areas on this trail. And in fact, one of the uh, the days has a 900 metre ascent and pretty much descent. Uh, and as a result, it's going to be a bit more slow going than what you would necessarily expect. Direction wise, I'm planning to travel from west to east. Uh, And this is a track that can be done in either direction. Uh, Now, from my perspective, and I think for a lot of hikers, west to east seems to be the most common direction, mainly because you are flying into the trailhead at Melaleuca and then basically walking to the trailhead or the ending trailhead at Cockle Bay, uh, and then you can get road transport out. There's nothing from stopping you doing this walk in either direction, but the disadvantage with going east to west is if the conditions are really bad and the planes aren't flying, you just have to wait until the next available day that the planes can actually get in and out of uh, Melaleuca. Whereas providing you can get into Melaleuca by plane, you can get out of there relatively easy on the day that you uh, have organised. One comment I would make here about the distances, I've based my distances based on uh, the the main guidebook for this track. It's uh, one of the John Chapman's books, and John Chapman is a well-known uh, trail writer, been around for quite a few years. And a couple of things I would comment here, that in looking at the distances in the guidebook and then looking at the distances on the website for this track, 
It's still an 85 kilometer track, but the days tend to vary. And I couldn't quite work out why that is. I mean, yeah, as I said, it all adds up to roughly 85 kilometers, but certainly the distances do vary depending on whether you're looking at the guidebook or looking at the website. Um, so, I mean, from that perspective, um, you know, worst case situation, you know, I've, I've allowed myself five days to do this walk, and it may mean that if the distances more closely match the uh, the website, I may have to vary which which are my longer and which are my shorter days. And I, as you say, if you if you're going west to east, then you've still got that opportunity to get road transport out the other end on any day you happen to arrive. Now, cost-wise, with a lot of tracks in Tasmania, so like the Overland Track, uh, if you're hiking the Overland Track during the uh, high season, if you like, not in the winter period, there is a track fee. Uh, Whereas with this track, there is no dedicated track fee as such. However, you do need to purchase a park entry fee, which is roughly around about $42 at the time of this podcast. Uh, the overland track, it's the cost of doing the track plus doing the park entry fee as well. So uh, in that respect, uh, it's a lot easier or a lot cheaper to do this track as far as the trip itself. However, you've got things like <laughs> the flight into Melaleuca. Now, this is December 2022, and my flight into Melaleuca is $329. Uh, now, potentially it could be more than that. They uh, There is a minimum number. If I was the only person on the plane, apparently the, the plane company or the, the airplane company uh, want a minimum of two hikers. So in worst case situation, I may have to t- pay a second airfare if I really wanted to go on that day. Having said that, though, um, I think it's pretty usual for the plane to be full. Uh, and in fact, I was actually planning on starting my walk physically next Friday, uh, now I'm starting at Saturday because I couldn't get a flight on Thursday. The Wednesday, the Thursday were fully booked up. So in that respect, um, you know, I don't expect to be the only person on the plane. And from what I understand, there's at least on average eight people that start from Melaleuca each day uh, and however many other people that are starting from Cockle Creek at the other end. So it's a consistently used, regularly used trail. Is there a limit on the number of people that start either end each day? Not at the moment. And this is this is the interesting thing. I think the limit tends to be uh, by the, the flights in and out. And potentially if the, uh, the the air company is could do two or three flights, there's potentially nothing stopping them from doing that. Although they are doing other flights around other parts of Tasmania. So I think if you wanted to try and get a, a 16 people in there as an example on one day, you'd probably have to book months in advance and organise something with them to run two flights. Uh, but by rights, there is no limit on, on the number of people that can start this walk. Having said that, though, one of the things that the South Coast track is well known for is the muddy conditions. Now, looking at the weather conditions for this part of Tasmania, uh, the expectation is rain on 250 days out of the year. Uh, now, this is not necessarily torrential rain, but you would expect rain. Uh, and it might only be in one or two millimetres, it might be very heavy sort of rain. Uh, so you've only got to go and look on the website and put in South Coast Track and have a look at the images, and there's a lot of images of people walking through uh, knee depth or, or slightly deeper mud oh, God. Uh, because the trails have been that badly worn uh, just by constant hikers going through day after day. I was talking to people from Tasmanian Parks who look after this area a few years ago and they said that um, the people that are using this now is becoming so – the traffic's becoming so heavy, uh, they're seriously looking at either either and, uh, limiting the number of people that can start the trail each day, or putting more, more boardwalks in to make it a bit more like the overland track. And that would certainly change the experience of the track. Yeah, but, I mean, this is this tension, isn't it, between the experience and also uh, preservation of the trail and the environment. Other costs associated with this trail are return from Hobart to Cockwell Creek. Now, if, if, if I do this by commercial transport, uh, the cost is for a, a single person is $110. It's cheaper if you organise a group. Um, but that will take me the roughly 120 kilometres back from Cockle Creek back to Hobart. Um, the person I talked to today who's done the track, they said there's a phone there. Uh, they 
they didn't have a, a mobile phone, but there was a phone booth there. They made a phone call, called their family who drove down, picked them up and took them back to Hobart. And that's handy if you happen to live in Hobart or somewhere close. Apparently, there was also the possibility of organising a taxi to come and pick you up to take you into a nearby town uh, and then get a bus which runs three times a day back into Hobart as well. And I'm sure that would probably be a cheaper option. So I've still got to finalise exactly which option I'm going to go through and do, uh, but I'll see how I go um, uh, over the next couple of days. I've got this, That's a job for me in two days' time when I've got a, a bit of spare time just before I uh, take my flight on Thursday. Trail tread-wise, this is very much a natural and remote sort of track. Uh, it's not, you know, gravelled track. It's not, you know, heavily signposted. It's not heavily heavy with facilities. It's very much a remote area trip. Uh, and again, it's you go onto the website and it does say this walk is for experienced hikers. But as I said, more and more less experienced hikers are doing this track. From what I can understand, it's, it's not going to be an issue of losing the trail because the trail is very obvious, but it's a matter of um, taking the time uh, and, again, maybe having to delay if the weather conditions are really bad. And certainly there are river and creek crossings, including one where you're required to row a small boat across the river. Uh, but uh, if um, there are also rivers where that have some ropes across them that you need to wade across, and the recommendation of it's, if it's above knee depth to basically wait until the water drops. And apparently while the water level can come up quite quickly, it also drops quite quickly. But this is one of these things that might add additional time to the trip. There's also some sections of beach and rock walking and the occasional timber and constructed trails. So we're very much like on the overland track where you've got very almost like boggy sort of areas, uh, almost wetland sort of areas. They've gone through and put narrow boardwalks in there just to keep you up and, and from damaging the environment really badly. And as I mentioned, potentially there is mud and it probably it is an expectation of mud as well. I was going to say potentially. I thought that was a little bit optimistic. Well, I think, it's, I think it's, there definitely will be. It's funny. When we did the overland track in 2017, we expected lots and lots of rain. And we did have rain for one day for about an hour and a half. But the rest of the days were actually quite nice. Uh, looking at the forecast for uh, certainly the, uh, the first few days, there's – three to four millimetres of rain, I think, forecast in one of the days. In the lead up to the, the, that walk and one of the other days, uh, it's actually quite clear. So it would be interesting to see what that's going to come up to and what that's going to look like. Facilities-wise, the only huts are at Melaleuca, which is where you fly in. And from there, the, the campsites are pretty much cleared natural camps. This is a fuel stove only trip, so no fires allowed on this trail. Uh, it's a remote area. The last thing I want uh, want happening is for for the a remote area catching fire. So it's yeah, it's fuel stoves. Now this is one of these logistical considerations that you can't uh, take pressurized gas on an airplane. So what happens there is uh, they actually drop uh, gas in. And when we land, they actually, you pay for the gas. And when you land, they actually give you a canister of gas. Uh, so it means that um, the gas will be picked up from, from the, uh, the airport at Melaleuca. What's not unusual is the gas canisters are the 230 gram size canisters, which is bigger than I'd normally would use. Normally, I'd be quite happy with a 100 gram canister for a six day trip. So gas supply isn't going to be an issue. Well, that's good because we've, we've had that very fine uh, judgment about the gas that we needed and then we ran out of gas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that's what happened when you use one night's worth of gas uh, and you and you run out on the last day. So, yeah, it's a, whether you need to know whether you need a full canister or a, a three-quarter canister. There are rainwater tanks along the trail but also natural water, so we'll be taking a water filter. Mobile reception in looking at Telstra's maps pretty much are non-existent. There's a couple of really tiny little spots that there might be a, a phone signal and there's one high point on the trail where that's possible, but it pretty much I'm expecting to have no phone signal. I will be taking a Garmin inReach device, which, which is basically a satellite communicator. And that, so that, that means that you can send me messages and I can track you, see, see that you're moving? Yep. Yep. And I will actually go through and uh, uh, put uh, uh, the trip on the uh, the website. So if those people that are interested, uh, I'll go through and put a Facebook link uh, on the Saturday, uh, which is when I start walking. Uh, 
So that'll be in, 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 the, in the next few days' time. Time of the year to walk. This is one of these trails where potentially you could walk this any time of the year. However, with Tasmania, you really do need to expect snowfall in wintertime. And in fact, one of my other options for doing this trail was around about two and a half weeks ago where they were actually getting really heavy rains and snowfall down to 500 metres. Uh, and there are some parts of this trail where I will be over 500 metres in height. So, But even in December, I would expect snowfall to be a potential, and that does impact on gear, which I'll talk about a bit more in a moment. So in relation to time of the year, the recommendation for what they class as a summer season is late November through to around about late March. So, and again, for me, uh, it was the December timing was just suited me well. Um, I had the time available just before a, a, an overseas trip we're planning. Jill has chosen not to do this track with me. There were other considerations for me. It wasn't just that it was in Tasmania and, and you know, less than a week before we went overseas. You know, some of us have to do some other things too, Tim. Well, it's not quite – well, it's less than a week when I get back anyway. Yes, that's so. right. Now, temperature-wise, um, summertime, the maximum temperatures, nighttime and daytime, is anywhere between 11 degrees to 38 degrees. Wintertime, minus 3 to 11 degrees. So again, I'm expecting to get nighttime temperatures down to around about 6 degrees at their coldest, although I am geared for colder conditions than that. So if it does get colder, uh, if I do get snow, I'm, I'm geared for it. And particularly when you're in Tasmania, you plan for all those conditions, so for it to be warm, for it to be cold, for it to be wet, for for it to be snowy. Now, gear-wise, in most cases here, the gear that I'm taking with me is pretty much what I take on just about any walk that I do. So I've still, I'm working on one of two packs that I'll be taking with me, and tomorrow night uh, I'll actually be going through and doing a pre-pack just to see how it goes. I'm either looking at a 36-litre pack or a 48-litre pack, uh, not a huge amount of weight difference between those two. If I can get away with a smaller pack, I just like having that smaller object on my back. It just feels so much so much better. And if I do go for the smaller pack, it won't be because I'm taking gear out. The gear I take with me will be exactly the same regardless of what pack I take. But if I can get away with a smaller pack, I certainly will. Well, I think if you can get it all into that 36-litre pack, it will be stretch to its limits. <laughs> yeah, it will be. I know I can do a four-day trip on a 36-litre pack. If I had a choice, I'd probably be looking at a 40-litre pack, but I don't actually own one of those. So it's a, it's a bit of a, a, a toss-up to see what I can get away with. And I will be carrying six days' worth of food, so I've got extra food just in case. And that it'll be the food that's going to be the bulky item, which it, it's what's in my pack. Well, the good thing is, though, I mean, you just – stretch it at the beginning and then eat your food and you're right by the time you get to the end. Well, that's it. I mean, really, you know, after a day, there's a day's less food in there and that's probably the difference between which pack I use, but I'll find that out tomorrow. I'm carrying a very lightweight two-person tent, and in fact, the tent is under a kilo in weight. The tent I carry, even though it's classed as two people, it's two extremely cosy people. Small and cosy. Um, small and cosy, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah if, you, if you were friends that didn't want to spoon, um, it, 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 <laughs> really, really, this is not the tent option. There, uh, I just don't think there's any chance you and I would be able to sleep in that two-person pen. No, tent. no. And, it, and it's from my perspective, one of the reasons I like this is it gives me a bit of space. Uh, it means I can have my pack inside the tent with me. And if it is pouring with rain, I don't have to worry about grabbing stuff from outside of the tent itself. I'll also be trying out a new sleeping bat. Um, for the last uh, eight years, I've been using a Thermarest x Light sleeping mat. Uh, and I've got a new mat, which I uh, have gone through and decided to replace my x Light with. And I'll be doing a write-up and a review of that post this trip. Certainly that x Light has had a lot of work um, and has lasted you very well. It has. And also, as you said, a stove and gas as well. I tend to take one of the jet boils along with me, uh, something lightweight, something simple. And I almost forgot the other day, but again, it's a, it's a sort of thing about having a good packing list, about some sort of mechanism for lighting the stove. 
I get used to carrying a two-person stove when Jill and I are hiking, which has a starter built into it. Uh, I've just got to remember when I'm doing a one-person stove to carry either a lighter or a fire still with me, just so I can remember to start it. Scenery-wise, this is it's it is a coastal track, but it's also inland. So in most cases, I'm not that far away from the coast. And there are some sections where we're doing some shorter beach walks. There's also some hill sections. Uh, there's also some flat open plains. And it's an interesting looking um, elevation map uh, where there's two, one really large lump in the middle of the, the track, uh, which is the Iron Ranges, which take me up to roughly about 900 metres. Which day is that? That's on the – I'll have to check in all honesty. I think it's on the second or the third day. So I'll see how that one goes. And everyone tells me that's the most difficult section of the whole trip. And there's also another uphill section as well, but certainly nowhere near as bad as the Iron Ranges. So I've, I've got that to keep in mind. One thing I find really interesting with this trip is, as I said, this is was considered to be one of the most – complex sort of trips to go and from a logistics perspective it is uh, but also um, reading through the John Chapman book they do say that you know if you're an experienced bushwalker you might find this track easy but I know from looking at John Chapman's books his concept of easy is probably most people's concept of medium to hard um, so it's um, it'll be interesting to see what it's like if you've never done a multi-day track before, um, yes, it's going to be difficult. There's no argument about that. And I don't expect it to be easy. I think I will earn my keep on this track. But certainly uh, I've, I've been used to doing longer trips and bigger days and it'll be interesting to see what it's like. I think in some respect it really will depend on the, the weather conditions, how easy or how, how difficult I perceive it. This is also Tasmania as well, so there'll be a lot of Tasmanian vegetation, a lot of... A lot of <laughs> Well, I mean, we when we did the uh, when we did the three capes walk roughly twelve months ago, it really didn't look like traditional Tasmanian vegetation. It was it almost looked like. <gasps> don't say yeah. it! Don't say it! It it looked like coastal New South Wales, <laughs> uh, and that was a surprise to us. So I think certainly uh, I will expect to have some of the more traditional Tasmanian vegetation, but also some of the coastal vegetation as well. Wildlife, um, I expect to see lots, including lots of snakes. Now, I have never seen a snake in Tasmania. It doesn't matter whether I'm with Jill or with a group, but we've never come across a snake. You know, big groups have seen them, uh, small groups have seen them. We just don't tend to. Now, I think one of the reasons for that is I tend to start fairly early in the morning. I don't tend to wait until 9 or 10 o'clock to start walking I'm usually walking by sort of 7.38 at the latest, and that's normally the cooler part of the day. So the snakes tend to be... Not yet out. Not yet out. So, But, yeah, I'm expecting to see snakes. And from my perspective, one of the piece of gear that I didn't mention is I usually don't carry gaiters on a trail, but for the mud and for the snakes, I'll be wearing gaiters on this trail just to be on the safe side. Uh, but as I said, it's really rare that I'll ever do a hike, and, in fact... This is the one of the few long-distance hikes. I'd recommend Lara Pinter using uh, gaiters, only from the spinifex, but certainly this one, it's the mud and the snakes, so it'll be interesting to see how it goes there. So we talked about the trail. We've talked about um, all of the things that you've been doing to prepare. How are you feeling at this stage, um, having done all of that planning and now you're knee-deep into the final stages of the preparation? Uh, reasonably good. I'm sort of. I'm always a bit apprehensive in relation to being able to fly in there on the day. The last thing I want is cyclonic winds for three or four days where we can't get in or I can't get in there. Yeah, and the the option is always to say, well, okay, I'll, I'll flip the trip and get a, a vehicle in and start at Cockle Creek End and and walk to Melaleuca and get a flight out. But the risk then is I could be waiting three or four days at the other end if the conditions are still bad. So that's probably the most apprehensive thing about this trail. I was actually expecting to have a fair degree of solitude in this trail, and I think I still will do, but given there's roughly eight people a day starting on this track, I don't think I'm going to be spending a day with not seeing anybody. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Yeah. Well, it is, you know, 80-odd kilometres, and, you know, most people, well, people starting your end, small number, relatively small number, so... It shouldn't, it shouldn't be too populated, I wouldn't have thought. 
No, it, you know, roughly eight people a day starting. Uh, I would expect to see, certainly on, on the first day, I'll see eight people that will that'll come in on the same flight. And depending on how quickly I'm walking, if I'm doing this track in five days and other people are choosing to do it in seven or eight, I may overtake some people and some people may overtake me. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. And I'm also likely to come across people who are going the other direction as well. So you mentioned that there were um, huts at Melaleuca. Um are you camping wherever you where, wherever you feel along the way, or are there are specific places you have to camp? As far as I can tell, um, it, there are designated campsites, but there's uh, there's nothing potentially stopping you from from camping in between. But certainly finding a cleared flat area, uh, and the bigger campsites do have uh, long drop toilets as well, so that's a, an added bonus. So I have planned on staying at designated campsites. But if need be, if something happens, if you know, I run out of time. Now, one of the things with this is on the bottom tip of Tasmania. Um, it's pretty much to almost at the longest days of the year. And I'm expecting, I think it's roughly around about 16 hours worth of daylight. Wow. Uh, now, that's not full sun. It's, it's, it's daylight. Yeah. So um, you know, it, potentially I could do some really long days if I wanted to you know, without necessarily having to walk very fast, even if I only walk two kilometres an hour, that's still potentially 32 kilometres in a day. Even if I walk one and a half kilometres an hour, I'm still going to do the distance that I've gone through and planned. So the time is is certainly there. I'm not particularly going to try and race through this. Um, you know, and again, I'm not likely to say, well, I've got I've got another three or four hours to go, I'll, I'll do another 10 kilometres. It's possible, but I'm, I'm quite happy with the five days that I've got scheduled. Well, I'm looking forward to checking your progress and um, following you along. Um, it is, you know, kind of the same, kind of different um, in some ways. So it will be interesting to see how you go. And, and um, uh, you know, this is another solo hike you're doing potentially in lots of uh, wet conditions. Yeah. So it'll be interesting. You attract them. You must. Yeah, yeah I think so. I think uh, uh, the two walks, other walks I've done this year, East Gippsland Rail Trail and the Great Ocean Walk, We've had sunny weather, but we've also had rain as well. So uh, given this is Tasmania, it has <laughs> lots of rain. And as I said, this area, you expect to get 250 rainfall days in the year. So rain is an expectation. Um, if I don't, that's really wonderful, but we'll see what happens. Okay, as mentioned, this is one of four planned podcasts for this track. So podcast 240 and 241 uh, will be on trail recordings, including from my leaving Canberra, uh, my flight into Melaleuca, and then also my trip back out at the end from Cockle Bay uh, and my flight home. So the final podcast episode, episode 242, will be a expectations versus reality to see how the trip actually stacked up uh, against my pre-trip expectations. Okay. That's all for this episode. We hope you've enjoyed and I hope you're going to enjoy following me along as I go on this trip. Unfortunately, I don't know if I'm going to be able to post anything because there really is going to be no phone and internet signal. So I'll save all the the posts up until after the trip. That's all for me. Bye for now. And bye from me. So uh, Jill has chosen not to do this track, this trick with me, this trap with me. <laughs> Jill has chosen to do this track. Uh, it's not.